And so we come to our final speaker of the session, Professor Callistus Juma. Thank you so much. I am very grateful to the three academies for giving me the opportunity to be here. I actually had a proposal based on the, the quality of the audience that we can just declare the conference a success at this moment <laughs> <laughs> and ask people to go and have lunch. Uh, I, the, what I really wanted to offer in, in regard to developing countries is a it's a positive message of the opportunities that exist today that make it possible for developing countries to make the sustainability transition. And there are basically two of them. One is that it's easier to do new things in places where you don't have incumbent industries. And so you can start from scratch uh, in most developing countries. Uh, secondly, you have the, the benefits of being a latecomer uh, in that latecomers inherit large stocks of scientific and technical knowledge uh, which they can put to use, uh, which also means that they can actually do that fairly quickly. Uh, and those combinations, in fact, uh, in my view, have not been expressed adequately in the area of, of public policy. Uh, but also in terms of the engineering community of thinking about where it might be possible to start doing, uh, doing some new things. And so, so I'm very interested in exploring this area of exponential growth in scientific and technical knowledge and to see the extent to which this can really make a, a big difference for, uh, for developing countries. Uh, and we do have some inspirational models that actually explain this. Uh, you can go back and look at the, the ethanol revolution in Brazil, uh, but we have other examples uh, that are actually quite, uh, quite instructive at the moment. Uh, one is uh, the, the area of mobile phones, uh, for example, when uh, the, the first mobile phone developed by Ericsson in 1956 uh, weighed about 42 kilos. You couldn't use it. Uh, to send text messages. Uh, the, but the, just because of advances, this has become ubiquitous. Uh, and we see really this happening actually fairly quickly. Uh, we know the story of mobile phones, but the next revolution is in fact going to come uh, from, from broadband, the adoption of broadband technologies. That is really, if you take Africa as an example, this is what Africa looked like in 2009. Uh, the entire eastern coast of Africa didn't have any connection to undersea cables. This is what Africa looks like today, literally in four years. Uh, this is a roughly $5 billion investment in cables. But what this map doesn't show you uh, is terrestrial wiring, most of which is going to rural areas. That is going to have a huge transformational impact uh, in extending the information revolution to rural Africa. There's roughly $8 billion of terrestrial cables installed just in, in four years in eastern and southern Africa. Uh, and this is triggering a new development that we hadn't really anticipated uh, until Recently, we thought that the only thing that African countries could do is participate in the development of, of software. We didn't think that they, there was actually capacity there to develop hardware that is adapted to local conditions. And this is mostly in transitioning from just mobile communication and starting to think about new areas like uh, mobile education. Uh, and suddenly, we see devices like this being developed by African countries. This is a a laptop developed by young engineers in Mauritius. And now if I was looking for a place where there might be breakthroughs in a new laptops for educational purposes, I wouldn't be looking in Africa. But that's why it's stuff is starting to happen. Uh, and I'm offering these examples because they have huge implications for sustainability. If you think of the connectivity that exists in Africa now, you couldn't achieve that 
connectivity using traditional landlines without having a massive uh, increase in the ecological footprint of communication. And so advances in science and technology and engineering, in fact, are making it possible uh, for developing countries to leapfrog uh, into new areas and actually to be able to do it, uh, to do it fairly quickly. Uh, another example of this is, uh, is the controversial one, which is the area of, uh, of genetically modified crops. Uh, for when these crops were introduced, at uh, the beginning it was argued that they will never benefit developing countries. Uh, as of this year, 52% of the hectare of genetically modified crops are in developing countries. And the growth is going to be in developing countries. And what we see, which is really interesting, is not just adopting existing traits. It's in fact developing countries, African countries starting to invest in research to develop crop, crops that address local conditions, particularly pest, pest resistance, stress resistance, uh, water efficiency. These are examples of activities going on in places like Uganda uh, and Nigeria and others with very little involvement of foreign enterprises. Most of the work that's being done, for example, on controlling banana wilt in Uganda is all funded by the public sector in Uganda. Uh, so we start to see a shift, in fact, in the use of these technologies to solving uh, local problems with huge implications for, for sustainability. Uh, Nigeria spends something like $500 million a year importing pesticides to control the pest that uh, destroys cow peas. Uh, that would be saved if they eventually uh, start commercializing the a variety they have developed on their own in one of their research institutions, actually one of their universities. Uh, and so, so these advances that we are seeing, we've seen the work that Craig Venter has done with the, with the sequencing of genomes, uh, that just makes it possible for African countries to do things that they could never have done uh, in the past. Uh, we're starting to see new areas, interest in new areas, particularly in the area of, of material sciences either with the water absorbent polymers uh, or water repellent polymers that are being now tried out in various, uh, various African countries. And again, it can be done, we've seen it's been done very quickly. We had just beginning of this year the establishment of a polymer research institute at one of the Kenyan universities. This was a product of six months of discussion with a very small country, Slovenia, two million people. And so we're starting to see leadership, in fact, in the sustainability arena coming from small countries, not the major, the major countries. Uh, and, and so this opens up for me really a new way of thinking about where partnerships might actually come from that may not come from the traditional large players, but most likely flexible countries that are committed to certain areas uh, of partnerships. And, and finally, I, it's really going to be driven, in my view, by a greater focus on the youth, particularly uh, in the developing countries, partly because of the age structure, but even more importantly, because the enthusiasm that this, the young people in developing countries have for science, technology, and engineering. Uh, and, and finally, we are starting to see the emergence of leaders in these countries that are dedicated to using engineering for development. Just last year alone, six African countries elected engineers as president, and I don't think this is a fluke. Uh, I think the challenges are starting to select for leaders who actually understand how to use science and technology to solve, uh, to solve problems. So I wanted to leave you with that as a, as a, just a, as a message and I look forward to your, your questions and comments, and thank you very much for your attention.